I think a lot of us, myself included, may struggle with the comfort level and share in the story. Before I go into my story, though, quick question so I have a sense of the audience. How many people in here are in nearly full-time ministry? Just raise your hand. Okay, it gives me a pretty good sense. You might guess that was a loaded question, okay? Because I always have this discussion about who's in full-time ministry and who's not. So I'm going to give you another opportunity to answer that trick question at the end of this talk. <clears throat> we'll see how you do the second round. Usually when I warn people, they do pretty well the second round. So, so my background, born and raised in California. I was an Orange County kid, and that was before the OC was cool. Okay? Um, and my claim to fame probably in my California upbringing is I was one of 12 children. So you, you, and, and nine sisters, so you can really feel sorry for me now, okay? Uh, so big Irish Catholic family, raised as a Catholic, um, and actually had a love, still have a love to this day for the Catholic Church. And uh, was actually, became a Christian as a, as a youth. I was involved in uh, Young Life, if you're familiar with, with that as a, as a program. And so kind of a progressive Catholic Church in, in, those, in that period of time. But the, the interesting thing about, if you look at my progression, is in, in terms of my faith walk and, and even my career, I was one of these that kind of looked at God and faith in a compartmentalized fashion. So you hear about the sacred and the secular. Well, God, God's kind of the sacred, and that was Sunday morning, and maybe even Monday, uh, Saturday evening, when they started the Saturday evening services, right? Uh, but it really wasn't an integral part of the rest of my world and my day. And I went to work for IBM initially out of college. And uh, one of the things I found out about myself early on is I'm a workaholic by nature. It's just the, the nature of how, you might say God made me, but it's certainly the nature of how I became in terms of, of my behavior. Um, my wife and I were married uh, pretty young. In fact, we had our third child by the time she was 24 and I was 25. So, and you can guess they're all girls. So we, we, we figured that out, that we weren't going to have any boys. But, uh, so I get in this career track, and, I, and I'm working really, really hard. And the other thing that I learned about myself in this process, in, in the working world, is I, I never met a job I didn't like, and I had a tendency to feel like I had the ability to control outcomes. I don't know if anybody else is guilty of that, but you have a tendency, and I'm a sales guy, right? I've, I've kind of been in and around sales and marketing my whole life, so chasing deals, and I've gotten a bit of a reputation over the years for chasing really large multi-million dollar deals, and if we were gonna make things happen, by golly, we had to make it happen, as though you get the sense that you're in control. And this is where I say God is kind of in this bucket, compartmentalized and convenient. And, and by the way, we always prayed before meals, so that, that, that's how we integrated him into my day, right? And in reality, God was not an integral part of my day. And I got more and more committed to my career, more and more committed to my work. Again, never met a job I didn't like, so it wasn't the problem was, wasn't, oh, I really hate spending all this time. Mine was the opposite problem. It's where I got my ego strokes. It's where I made a lot of money. It's where I got an opportunity to have a lot of relationships. And the problem is things suffer when that happens. We moved six times in the first nine years of our marriage. Guess who got to do most of the heavy lifting in the move? My dear wife, who I'm delighted to say we've now been married 28 years. So she was patient with me through my process, and good, the, the good news is I'm still a work in process. But I always had this wrestling match with God. My wrestling match with God was probably different than some of you, but I'll bet alike in many, many ways. And that was, Lord, how in the world could you put me on this earth and give me a set of skills that you've given me and expect me to spend most of my waking hours making money for shareholders? And of course, I was one of these guys who had this aspiration that, boy, at some point, I'm going to save enough money to be able to retire, and then I'm really going to be able to do kingdom work. I can make the sacred everything. Well, you know how God works, right? I think if I would have done that and be 65 and I finally have, quote, enough money to retire, what happens the next day? 
you have the heart attack, right? You have something. And probably the first real wake-up call for me in a big, big way was when I was diagnosed with a melanoma. Now, I'm one of the, remember, Orange County lifeguard, swim coach, we used to bake in the sun, right? So I'm, I'm convinced if I'm going to die of anything, I'm going to die of skin cancer. But when you get to a relatively young age and you're working way too many hours and traveling globally, at some point it kind of makes you, it's, a, it's that old thing that God doesn't know how to get our attention until he grabs us by the collar and says, you know, when you were rocking and rolling, it was really hard to get your attention. Do I have it now? Anybody else guilty of that? I'm convinced, and there's a fair number of people in this room who are in career transition. It's one of the blessings of career transition if we'll listen to what God's trying to teach us in the process. So, so, so there's, there's my wrestling match is, Lord, how can I try to do the things you want me to do with the gifts you've given me and still have balance in my life, still pay the bills? We were one of these high-income, high-spend families. How do we make all of this work? And how do, we, how do we make all of this happen? And that's really one of the reasons I wrote this crazy book called A Better Way to Make a Living and a Life. And, and, and here was the observation. I, I have this crazy fascination with the topic of work and specifically how work and faith connect. And, and I'm struck by several things. I'm struck by the number of different ways there are to make a living. Does anybody, I mean, Paul was telling me a story his son is employed by an organization that it's called couch surfing, right? Where they basically allow people to stay on people's couches throughout the world. And there's over a million members. And he does all the user interface and web development for couchsurfing.com or org or whatever it is. I mean, does anybody else just listen to that stuff and say, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> right? And I have, I actually write about a friend of mine in the book who's, who makes his living in G.I. Joe land. He is, the, he is the Hasbro action figures toy club president, making a better living than most of us in this room. That's what he does for a living. He quit IBM and 9X to go do that. So I'm fascinated by that. I'm also fascinated by how many miserable workers there are in this country. And the statistics would say that there's 75 million relatively miserable people. And I have this hypothesis about miserable workers. And that is, if I took 10 men and women who were self-professed miserable, and I lined them up on a wall, and I said, OK, boys and girls, what do you really want to do? If you had your druthers, what would you be doing? And they tell you. And then you grant them the wish. And you check with them two years later, what do you think you'd find? They'd be relatively miserable again, <laughs> which says, that it's not necessarily the content of the work that makes us happy or miserable. I would argue that it's the context of work. And in fact, specifically, I think it's the purpose of work. I think there's some other dimensions of it, but I think purpose is the every person's struggle. And part of the reason I believe that's true is because Rick Warren sold 28 million books called The Purpose Driven Life. The number one hardback book in the history of this country. Why is that? Because a whole bunch of people struggle with, why am I here? How do I make sense out of spending most of my working hours doing something? If I were to ask all of you, what's the purpose of work? What's the first immediate reaction? pay the bills, right? To pay the bills. There's, it's an obvious answer, isn't it, Peter? And I think for as long as the average human has the view that work is intended to pay the bills, I think it's kind of an empty pursuit. So it, that's why I say it begs the question, what was God's grand design? Why did he create work? And this is the thing I've struggled with and will continue to struggle with and why I researched the book and I tried to talk to people who have kind of figured out how to go from the treadmill orientation to having a sense of peace, right? a sense of fulfillment, a sense of, of, of peace about the eternal future. And, and that's why I wanted to share a couple of things in the scripture that, that in my research, as I ask the simple question of, of God and say, okay, 
please, Lord, make it clear to me why you created this thing called work and we're supposed to spend most of our waking hours doing it. First one I'd like to share is that of Colossians. Colossians 3.23. I'll bet many of you in the room know it. Right? Whatever you do, work at it heartily. As working for what? As working for the Lord, not for man. Which says there's a hint for us, right? The hint is, maybe the purpose of our work is to be God glorifying in the process. As opposed to simply being an attempt to pay the bills, perhaps. Another question, I, I, one of the things I love was a question that one of the Pharisees asked Jesus. And, and he, of course, the Pharisees were always asking the trick question. Okay, Lord, what is the one thing, right? What's the one thing, the greatest commandment? And how did Jesus deal with that? He said, there's not one, there's two, right? He says, number one, love, your Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. If you're thinking about purpose, if you read Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, one of the central themes there is, you know what, we can get focused on all the success and making things happen and building businesses and selling and acquiring and investing and all these kinds of things. But number one, Jesus said is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. What's the second thing he said? Love and serve others as yourself. Okay, so in my humble opinion, there's a little bit of a hint there that says maybe that's what this thing called work is all about. It, it forces us to say, what, what can I do to equip myself